Hey, we're, I just really feel to just jump right into the message, get to the message today, and I believe we're going to walk out of here victorious in Jesus' name. In uh, the Bible, in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see this prophet named Elijah. Somebody say Elijah. And this man is on fire. Like he is a f- fully faith, powerful, preaching prophet of the Lord. And uh, there's uh, this situation going on with Ahab and Jezebel, and, 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 and there's this idolatry. They're, they're worshiping Baal, they're worshiping small g gods and not worshiping the God. And so Elijah, this firebrand preacher, decides to put on a competition. Who likes competition? Anybody, anybody playing fantasy football? Competing in a competition of some sort? Uh, people online. There's a few people raising their hands. All right. So I like competition. I'm a competitor. With the Strengths Finders test, competition is like my number one. I, I, I compete. If there's nothing to compete against, I will find something. I will compete against myself. Uh, it, it's just the way that I'm built. It's the way that I'm designed. Well, Elijah was this competitor, and, and he starts this competition, and, and, and just track with me. If you've never heard the story before, that's okay. You just need to know one thing. Elijah was this mighty man of faith, and he puts on this competition, and, and he, he invites a bunch of people. He invites the whole nation to witness this competition. So what they're going to do is there's this big altar, and they're going to make a sacrifice, but instead of taking their, their big lighter and lighting the fire, they're going to call on their God or gods to light that fire for them. And so he graciously lets the Baal worshipers go first, and, and, and they pray, and nothing happens. And they pray again and nothing happens. And they start doing ridiculous. They start cutting themselves and they start doing all these things, things to try to get their gods, little G gods, to do something, to light the fire and nothing happens. And I love how Elijah handles this. He starts making fun of them. He's like, oh, I, I think maybe your God, they, they took a bathroom break. Do we, do we need to pause this? Do we need to do a timeout and let the, you know, they're, they're, they're on a potty break right now, in other words. And I, I can imagine how infuriating uh, that made these people. Then it came Elijah's turn, and I love this, because, listen, there, there's, a, there's a confidence that you have, so confident that it's not even confidence anymore. It's Godfidence. Somebody say Godfidence. You can have so much confidence in God that it can turn into Godfidence. And he says, all right, well, to make it fair, let's pour water on the altar. And so they pour water on the altar, and you've got to know that at this time there's a mass drought that's going on there's no water so water is worth more than gold at this point and so they he pour they pour the water on top of this altar and Elijah just simply prays and what happens when he simply prays fire comes down and the whole sacrifice is burnt up and with that they just go into like ninja mode and they start wiping out all the Baal uh, worshiping priests and there's this great victory for Elijah and Israel and the the prophets of God at this time and that's all in chapter 18 like we should there should be a movie out there about this there really should like a modern day movie and it would I would watch it it's awesome But then, see, that's all wonderful and great. A mountaintop experience for Elijah. But then chapter 19 happens. Chapter 19 happens. And this is where I I just, I want to talk to you today about what to do when you're down. Because I I don't care how full of faith you are today. If we're not careful, we can find ourselves in a place of just being down. You, you can find yourself in a place of depression. You can find yourself in a place of anxiety. You can find yourself in a place of just not meeting your sales requirements. There, there's all kinds of things. Uh, it's not just emotional being down. Sometimes you might have been the all-star employee at your company for months and months and months, and then all of a sudden last month just didn't go the way that you wanted it to, and now you're experiencing a down moment. Maybe your finances are down. Maybe, maybe your, the, the, the fire in your relationship with your spouse is down. Well, I want to talk to you what to do when you're down. But first, we've got to kind of dig into what happened with Elijah. So in chapter 19, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 1, I'm telling you, this is right after he had this great victory. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done. 
including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent this message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you killed me. Now this is an empty threat and we know why because this time tomorrow Elijah wasn't dead and she didn't follow through with what she was talking about. But there's something I, I want you to know and see about Jezebel here is that she had a cognitive bias. She had a, somebody say cognitive. I just want to see how it sounded you, with you saying a cognitive bias that was backed up by confirmation bias. And we all have cognitive bias, a bias and a, a confirmation bias, but a cognitive bi what a cognitive bias does to us is it, cause, it stops us from seeing reality. It stops us from seeing what's really there. A cognitive bias you bring in all your life's experiences and everything that you've experienced in life. And, and it's this lens that you perceive everything through. And so that when you see this, you don't see what's really there. You see what your cognitive bias allows you to see. And every single one of us have cognitive biases and, com uh, and confirmation bias. And for Jezebel, she has this cognitive bias. That's why you can take someone in the same church service or situation and one person say, wow, that was a miracle. God really did that. And, 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 and say someone gets healed. Wow, God really did that. But an atheist might have a cognitive bias and say, well, they really didn't. They, didn't, weren't, they were not really sick. Why? Because they have a co cognitive bias that leads to confirmation bias. Confirmation bias is that no matter what evidence is presented to you, you only search for that which proves your point. In other words, you don't care about getting it right. You care about being right. You, so much so, it's, it's subconscious. Like literally, God could do a miracle in front of some people's eyes, in front of some people's faces. God could do something miraculous and amazing, but because of the cognitive bias and, and, the, and the confirmation bias, People can miss it and not even know it. This is why it's so important. That's why we can sit in church. This is what I've determined in myself, and this is just a side point. I've determined in myself, no matter how often I go to church and who's preaching and who's worship it leading, I'm going to get something out of it. God has something for me. So I've set myself up for cognitive bias that I'm going to get something. That I'm going to receive something. That, that there's something that I'm going to get. And, and, and we can set ourselves up for success like that. But sometimes there are people, not many, nobody in here ever, and nobody watching online, you set yourself up to be disappointed every single week. You're never going to get anything. because Why? It's not because you're not a good person. It's not because the Lord doesn't love you. It's not because you don't love the Lord. It's because you've said in your mind that you've been there, done that, seen that, heard that, and there's no change ever going to happen. Well, that's going to break in Jesus' name today. See, Jezebel had that. How else can you explain? She saw God do some crazy miracle things and she heard it. Well, actually, she didn't see it because she refused to go, which that's a whole other message. I'm not going there today. But it's like, I, I, I just have this thing in me. I never want to miss that one message that God has for me. And if I'm not in church, then I'm going to miss it, potentially. Uh, I, just, I just don't want to ever miss what God has for me. I just don't, don't want to do it. Well, Jezebel... She heard the miracles that God did. And yet, despite the facts, like how did one man cause all of her prophets, over 400 of them, to be killed? You'd think they'd be like, oh wait, there's something going, God is real. Maybe I should serve that God. But instead of repenting, instead of turning, she hardened her heart. She kept going in that direction, in the direction that she should not have gone. Jezebel had a cognitive bias. She had a bias against faith, true faith. And so you'd think, like, seriously, if you just caused God to bring fire from heaven on a drenched, wet altar, and God did this miracle in front of everybody, it's not like, it's not like that world record bash you caught that nobody was around to see. <laughs> it wasn't like one of those deals. You know, it wasn't like the hole-in-one you got at the golf course that just so happened that day nobody showed up and you got the hole-in-one. No, this was something that God did in the middle of everybody with Elijah and his faith. So you'd think uh, Elijah would just call fire down on Jezebel, but that's not what happened. Verse 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. I got a lot more to say about that, but keep going. Verse 4. Someone say verse 4. Then he went alone, on alone, into the wilderness, traveling by day. The enemy wants to get you alone. 
Just going to put that in there right now. The enemy wants to do everything he can to get you alone, to separate you, to cause you to be by yourself. See, we are sheep. The Bible refers to us believers as sheep. And sheep are wonderful when they're in the group, when they're part of the, 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 the way that God created us to be. God created us for each other. But do you know sheep, because of its design, it's like got short legs and a big body. So when it rolls over, it can't get back up again by itself. Did you know that? Like it's, I, as a kid, I had sheep and I've, I, I saw sheep like rolling around, but you, when that happens, another sheep comes over and nudges it and helps it up. Well, if there's no other sheep around, you can't get up. And so that's why the enemy wants to get you to isolate yourself so that you're walking around like a little sheep tipping over and even the smallest little thing can destroy the believer if they're disconnected from the body, if they're disconnected from relationship, if they're disconnected, because the enemy's goal is to get you to be isolated. All right, I got to move on. He sat down, so verse 4, the enemy wanted to separate him, get him to be alone, and as he's traveling, he sat down under a solitary broom tree and prayed that, the, that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. I mean, this guy is a guy who just saw miracles, signs and wonders, and crazy things that God did. And now, just a chapter later, he's this desperate in his life. Sounds pretty pathetic unless you've lived this. And I would guess by the look on some people's faces here, some of you have lived this. And maybe you're living this now. I, just got, I have good news for you. There's victory in Jesus' name. Verse 5. Then he lay down and slept. If you have your Bibles, you want to underline that first part of verse 5. He lay down and slept under the broom tree. But as he was sleeping, the angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around, and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and laid down again. Just two more verses. Verse 7. Then the angel of the Lord, somebody say, angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more, or the journey ahead of you will be too much for you. Verse 8. So he got up and ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to travel 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God. The mountain of God. So what are we supposed to do when we're down? Elijah was down. Maybe you're here today watching online or in person, and you might not be this far down, but maybe you are. Maybe you're just giving a look. Maybe you're contemplating some serious decisions today, and I want to tell you, don't give up. Don't quit. Keep pressing on. And, and, and there's some very simple things here that God has for us on what to do when we're down. But, but here's the challenge uh, it, for us is that when we live by faith, we're not ever supposed to have a struggle or a challenge or a difficulty, are we? That is the, the, great, the right response from everybody, praise the Lord. See, I think so many believers think that, 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 man, if I'm a man or woman of faith, I'm not supposed to have any challenges or problems or issues. Well, I've got good news and bad news, whether, however you want to take it. Be full of faith. Being full of faith doesn't mean you'll never face a challenge, an obstacle, or a problem. What it means is that when you face the problem, obstacle, or challenge, you're going to get through it. You're going to overcome it. That mount, there's no mountain too high, no valley too low. God is going to be with you and help you get through it. But we have to have a game plan. You know, in sports, uh, th th there are game plans that we have to have. There are plays that you have to run in sports if you want to win. And, uh, uh, and it's football season, and so uh, the uh, natural desire is to share with you uh, a story about the Patriots and how they come back to win and all that stuff. But, but uh, I want to bring you to a more important story, a story that I lived, the squeeze play as I was reminded after this morning's message, that that's not a bunt, that's a squeeze play. That's more accurate. So you have to know about me in baseball as a kid, I was really good at hitting, but I was terrible at bunting. A bunt is where you kind of turn and you just bunt the ball down on the ground, and I couldn't do it. Like I tried, but like my reflexes, so like I, my, I had too good of reflexes. I had reflexes like a cat, <laughs> just instant. I just couldn't do it. And so no matter what I did, and it would always pop up and go right to the pitcher. And anybody that's a baseball coach watching online or here that's ever done it, or softball, 
you angle the bat. Yeah, I had people teach me that. I could, angle, I could do like a 90 degree angle and the ball would still pop up and go to the pitcher somehow, some way. I don't know how. It just happened. Well, there was this scenario where in this game, I think it was a championship game, but it was a long time ago. For the story today, we'll just pretend it was, a cha- it was, the, oh, it was the championship of championships today. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, so it was, uh, there was one out, there was a person on second and third, second base and third base, and it was the last inning, and it came time for the squeeze play. The squeeze play is where the batter gets up there because there's only one out, and, and the f- person on third base will attempt to steal home plate, and the person bunting will put the ball down on the ground and, and run to first. So even if he gets thrown out at first, there's no play at the plate, and so that person wins. So we were down by one point. And so uh, I remember watching from the dugout because I, was no long, I wasn't in there because I couldn't do a, 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 a bunt. And so this is the, he turns, the pitch comes in, he turns, and the first one was a bad pitch, so the guy's running down, so they, they know the squeeze is on. They, they know that the, the, this is going down, so it, it was a ball, and, uh, and something, something happened, as I'm remembering the story. No, he fouled it. There we go. As you remember a story, you remember more, but when you tell a story, you remember more. He fouled it, so it was strike one. It was coming at him, strike one. So everybody knew what was up. Everybody knew what was going on. It was intense. And normally I want to be in those situations, but because I knew I was that bad at bunting, I remember just sitting there thinking, I'm so glad that I'm not the one trying to bunt right now. (laughs) And and so I'm watching this, and and the pitch comes in, he bunts it, perfect little dribbler down third base. The person running, I mean, he's more than halfway to home plate by the time the guy gets the the pitch, the, the ball. And like half of you that are not baseball fans right now are like, you're just nodding and smiling. (laughs) <laughs> For those of you that like, is there touchdowns in baseball? You're just, you're going to get this in just a minute. Turns, knocks the ball down. The person takes it. There's no play at home plate. So they throw it to first base, but they overthrow first plate, first base. And so now the person that's rounding third base is able to score. And so we tied it with one run. And then the next guy came in and we won the game. And it was wonderful. Everybody shouted. It was great. And then the coach, I don't know if he was doing this to be mean to me, but he decided to give me the game ball for, not, for being such, having such a good attitude on sitting on the bench and letting my spot uh, be taken for that situation. All right. The point of all that is this. We never would have won that game. The Patriots never would have won against the Atlanta Falcons that time if they didn't have a game plan, if they didn't have some plays that they could use to come back from behind and win. And so what we need to do is we need to have some plays that we can play. Somebody say, play ball. So play number one, we see from Elijah's example, is we have to rest and eat. We have to rest and eat. Listen, why did God rest on the seventh day? If you're thinking it's because he's tired, sorry. The Bible, the Bible says that he never grows weary and he never gets tired. And so God rested on the seventh day to show us that we need rest, that we need to take times of, uh, uh, of rest. And, and maybe you work seven days a week and you don't have that opportunity. Then what we have to do is we've got to find the best rhythm that you possibly can have in order to rest. And then pray, Lord, help me set, uh, set up my lifestyle the best way uh, according to your word and according to how you would want it. So somebody say Rhythms. See, I cannot get up here and give you 16 principles to having rest because everybody's schedule is different. Everybody's situation, situation in life is different. And so it's so important that you prayerfully ask God, how can I get rest? Maybe that's uh, taking a half, a half day off every once in a while. Whatever it is, you need to get rest. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. I used to pride myself on the fact that I could get three hours of sleep a night and be fine. And then we had kids and learned that, and, and I still thought I was fine, but my attitude stunk. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my wife no, never had an attitude, no change at all. She was just perfect. I'm telling you, rest is so vital. And that's why I think Elijah's first example to us, when he was running, when he was fleeing, when he was, when he was, when he was down, he rested. Rest doesn't always come from sleep. But it's hard to have rest if you don't sleep. And so this next point I'm going to make might be only for one person in this entire room. Or if it's too sensitive, then it's for only our online audience. But 
the tendency when we're feeling pressure, when we're feeling pressure and, and stress, is that sometimes we think, oh, I need entertainment. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll binge Amazon Prime or Hulu and watch TV until midnight. And then we have to get up in the morning. And then we just go through the cycle over and over and over. And what we're doing is we're exhausting ourselves. And especially men in this room today and online, when a man is exhausted, it's easy to be defeated. When a man's exhausted, it's easy to be defeated. Why don't I talk about the women? Because I'm not a woman and I don't know. <laughs> but I'm sure with women, there's, when you're, God did not create your body to go on empty and be exhausted naturally. God wants you to have rest. And so if that's you, if that's, you're the one person, shut, ha, have a shut off time. Okay, at, at 9 p.m., entertainment, TV stuff is off. But here's the thing. It's important to rest, but don't hibernate. It's important to rest, but don't hibernate. Don't, don't go to bed real late and then sleep in until 9 a.m. or 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. Because that, that's so detrimental to your body and the natural. Yes, pastors have to talk about the natural things sometimes. Because if we're not doing the natural things right, it's hard to get to the spiritual things. If you get two hours of sleep, of course, you're not going to be able to do the next piece here that we're going to talk about. Eat. Rest and eat. And here, eat. rest is natural. Eating is supernatural. I'm not talking about eating food here. I'm talking about eating the word of God. Listen, if we, what to do when we're down, it's essential that we rest and that we feed on the word of God. Somebody say amen to that powerful point. Come on. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4. But Jesus told him, no. Somebody say no. The scriptures say, people do not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And so we need to feed and eat on the word of God. It's essential that we feed on the word. Listen, our, our relationships... Our, our, our attitudes, uh, our habits at work, everything is hinged on our relationship to the word of God. Usually, and by usually I mean all the time, if there's an issue in somebody's life, including my own, there's evidence there, you just have to trace it back and see, okay, what is my relationship with the word? I find, I find it, very, listen, it's going to sound so simple. You're going to be like, how is, that's so simple. How can that be true? Try it and watch I, 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 it's, there's just this connection. You'll never find people that are rooted in the word of God with a healthy appetite and a healthy diet of the word struggling through life. Notice that doesn't mean there's no challenges. It's just when those challenges come, those who have a healthy diet. Uh, and what I mean, that's one thing that you can be a glutton with, by the way. <laughs> be a glutton with the word of God. O over if you're going to indulge yourself, overindulge yourself. Put the Twinkies away and get the word of God in you. Overindulge, fill up, feed up, just overdose on the word of God. And, I, and I'm telling you what will happen is, yes, you'll face a mountain, you'll face a challenge, you'll be issues, but you'll come at it completely different and you'll have victory every single time. Can I get an amen? Somebody say rest and eat. That's play number one. The second play is face the mountain that is in front of you. So Elijah, he ran. I mean, I, I, I picture like, you ever see like the ninja, like the uh, uh, ninja movies? Like they just have this outfit and they're running like on the air kind of. Like they, like fighting, fighting dragon, kissing lions or some, some weird. Yeah. But all those like Japanese kung fu, kung fu movies, that's the term. Kung fu movies. Like they can like float in the air. Like, yes, that right there, Brittany. Thank you. Thanks for the chickens, by the way. Such a big help. Two of our chickens, as you know, got eaten. Well, we've had, the Lord provides. <laughs> so I picture Elijah running through the desert, like, pew, like that anyway. Like, when you read the word, let your imagination run wild. Like, it makes it more interesting. That's why we do exegesis and hermeneutics. It brings us back into alignment with truth. But let your ima imagination run wild with the word. And literally, I could picture Elijah just like floating on the air woo, after eating the food that God prepared for him. And when, when he got to his destination, he had, a, he had a mountain to face. See, when we're down and we're struggling, it's so often that instead of facing the mountain, we bury our heads in the sand. We pretend the mountain isn't there. I can't tell you how many people I've counseled that have had financial difficulty. And it's just, yes, they have financial difficulty, but 
their response is to like, just pretend it's not there. And that, and that sounds awful, but if anybody's ever been in fin financial difficulty, you know how easy it is. It's just, it's hard to look at stuff sometimes. And, and when you've got that amount, all these pressures, maybe pressure from your kids, pressure from your school, pressure from your spouse, pressure this way, pressure that way, it's sometimes easier just to look away. But that's not gonna solve the problem. You've gotta face the mountain. And, and, and that's what Elijah did. Elijah faced the mountain, and when he looked at the mountain, he said, you know, God, God, everything's good. I'm so full of faith. Everything's perfect. I, you, you know, you got this, and you're just, everything's fine. That's not what Elijah did. But that's what we want to do. See, we have a problem with getting real with God. And so what happens is, if we don't get real with God, then, then, then we do get real with the wrong people, and the wrong people can cause us to go in the wrong direction. But if we get real with God, God will help us get real with the right people, and then there's victory. Can I get an amen? You know, Elijah said, look, I, I'm in a mess. There's a, this is a bad situation. This lady wants to kill me. And, and all, all, it gives God an opportunity to speak truth into your life. But I love the passage in James. I want us to walk out of here full of faith and ready to take on whatever challenge God has in front of you. And, and, and I love what James says about Elijah in, in James chapter 5, verse 17. He says, Elijah was a human as we are. Look at that. Underline that. If you have your Bible, you'll want to underline that. Just, just right there, just that statement, not even the rest of the scripture, speaks volumes. Like, because you have to ask, anytime you read something in the scripture, you have to ask, what is that there for? Like, why did the author decide to put this in there? Because God wants us to know that Elijah was a human just as you and I are. Yes, the man that did this crazy miracle with the prophets of Baal and all these people and called fire down from heaven and God answered his prayer and God moved all of this stuff. The, the same guy that, that saw, saw the little the, the cloud the size of a man's fist. Yes, God wants to do a mir big miracles and he can do miracles like that in your life. Because why, why do I know that? Because the author in James says this, Elijah was just as human as we are. And he goes on to say, and yet when he prayed earnestly, Notice earnestly, not two seconds of a prayer, oh God, help me, but earnestly sought the Lord that no rain would fall, none fell for three and a half years. But at the first part of that verse, we also have to say, but Elijah was a human as we are. So the same Elijah that was over here and experienced the miracles and the amazing things is the same Elijah that over here was running away from a woman that wanted him dead. That was running in fear. That, that, that one minute was on top of the mountain, the next minute was facing the mountain. And so if Elijah went through seasons of life like that, then you and I have to know that there's going to be opportunities for growth in the same kind of way. There's going to be mountains. Listen, at the beginning of the year, God did not sit down and tell me, hey, there's going to be a pandemic that the whole church is going to have to traverse through. And when I say the church, Big C Church, is going to have to traverse through. And here's 16 easy steps for accomplishing ministry during a pandemic. There was nothing like that. And guess what? Well, if God sat down and told you ahead of time, i got to have a conversation with you because you never told me. <laughs> but guess what? We face the mountain. We're plowing through. And I don't know if we're in the middle of it, the beginning of it, or the end of it. All I know is God is faithful, and he's getting us through this thing. Amen. we got to face the mountain. Yeah, it stinks that we have to wear masks. It stinks that there's this and there's that. And it stinks that, yes, there's actually persecution. Actually, I don't know if that stinks. I think that's a good, I'm glad, I'm, I'm happy that there's different persecution throughout the country right now because it's causing believers to rise up and be like, wait a minute, this thing is real. They're, they're, I, I got to stand firm in my faith. But let's face them out. Let's, let, let's right now, in fact, I want to pray for us right now so that, that we will not hide from the mountain, that we'll face the mountain right now. Father, I pray for every person here that, Lord, we won't, will not bury our heads in the sand we will not be intimidated. Lord, in areas that maybe we were once intimidated and afraid in the past, Lord, we will not act that way anymore. We will face whatever mountain is in front of us in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right, the final one. So that's play number two. I'm giving you three plays that we can play when we're, when we're down. 
And, and the beauty of having these plays is that if you have them, sometimes you won't even have, to, it's better to have the plays to use and never have to need them. It's good to be able to have a really great Hail Mary pass and never have to use it than to need a Hail Mary pass and not have it. So play number three is going to blow your minds. Draw close. Draw close. Worship team, if you'll come on up, that would be a huge help to me. So as we keep on reading, this is, just stick with me for like five more minutes because this is powerful. This right here is you, worth you coming at all today or joining us online right here at the end. You read a little further in chapter 19, verses 11 through 13, it says this. Go out and stand before me on the mountain. So this is God speaking to Elijah. Go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord said to him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by. And a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. So th this is happening. A, a mighty windstorm hit the mountain right in front of Elijah. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. Check this out. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the, the earthquake. Verse 12. And after the earthquake, there was a fire. Somebody say fire. God's got to be in the fire. Wait, did, G, we're, we're called to be baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire. God's got to be in the fire. But what does the Bible say? But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was the sound of a gentle whisper. Somebody say gentle whisper. When, and you all said it so gently. That was very unique. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. See, God is capable of speaking in the fire, speaking at the, the wind that crashes in the mountain. God is, in other words, God is able to speak very loudly. But God isn't always speaking very loudly. Sometimes he very strategically speaks very softly and very gently. Why? Ask God. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he does it the same reason that Jesus would speak parables. See, God, God, does, God does not want us to have this posture going through life when it comes to our relationship with him. Just kind of lean back like, you know, whatever God has for me, he'll show me. No, God wants us to lean in. See, if I, I'm talking to you like this and I begin to, and if I didn't have a mic and there were not people watching online, and, and, and I just started to whisper like this. And I said, okay, what am I? If I'm talking like this and I say things like, okay, now you hear what I'm saying. And, and, and some of you are like, whoa, okay, you, you do want to lean back and pull away a little bit. But if I start talking like this and I say something like, you know, for you that will absolutely change your life and your family's life. And, and start speaking. See, some of you right now, in fact, changed your position a little bit. You, you start, even the position, you, you just, there's something in you with that whisper that caused you to kind of lean forward and lean in. Maybe online, maybe, I don't know what it sounds like online for you, but maybe in your, in your, in your couch, you kind of, you just leaned in a little bit. And see, that's what God wants from me and from you. He wants us to lean in. He wants us to press in. See, he, he, he needs us to draw near. The Bible says that if we draw near to him, then he will draw near to us. Oh, how I wish the Bible said it the other way around, that he will first draw near to us, then we will draw near to him. Because if he did that, that would be a lot easier. But the Bible doesn't say that. It says if we draw near, then he will draw near. If we're down, we have to learn to draw near. We have to learn to draw near, no matter how tough that is. Look, there's distractions. Like right now, if you're watching online or even in here in person, you might have gotten 15 texts, different things. It's so, there's so much stuff, but even in the midst of all that chaos, you can still draw near. Lean in. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I've, I've got a question for us today. You're here today and well, first, just if you're here today and you felt down, not, not, I mean, it can be complete depression or, or whatever, but it doesn't have to be that extreme or real. Maybe just things haven't quite gone the way that you want, and it's frustrating and it's making it hard for you walking in your faith, and, and you're like, oh, is this ever going to end? Maybe you are experiencing deep depression, whatever it is. If you're here and you're feeling down, 
I want you to put your hand up nice and high right now. I want to pray with you. I want to pray with you. I see those hands. See, that's not lacking faith because you can put your hands down. It's okay to admit that because here's the, what I'm not saying is that, oh, you're going to leave here and still be depressed. <laughs> you're going to leave here and still be defeated. No, because that's not what Jesus is offering today. Jesus is offering victory today. Jesus is offering uh, 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 for you to become an overcomer. And so if the, you raised your hand, what we got to do is we got to rest and eat. We've got to face the mountain. We have to draw close. Rest and eat, face the mountain, and draw close. Rest and eat, face the mountain, draw close. I don't know what sleep looked like for you last night, but I do know you've eaten on the Word of God. We've had a lot of scripture today. So you've eaten. You're, you're full of faith. You've got, the mechanism of faith is fed within you right now to receive whatever it is that God has for you. You can receive today. You're facing the mountain. By raising your hand just now, you just face the mountain and draw close. As we pray and we close in worship today, this is, that, that's us drawing close, to, drawing close to him. If we'll stand up, I want to pray for you, and then I just want to worship. So let's stand up, everybody across this auditorium. God, listen, God is going to do something powerful right now. God is going to do something powerful right now. And I'm going to give this second invitation. Uh, people online, thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, if you want personal prayer, message us on Facebook. Reach out to us, and we'll make it a point to reach out to you and personally pray for you. God bless, and we will see you again next week. Um, now, for those of us here today, give me a thumbs up when we're cleared. We good? For those of us here today, if you need a healing in your body, then this altar is open. I want to pray for you. I'll, I'm going to put on a mask, and I'm going to pray for you. The altar is open. The altar's never been closed, but I don't think I've done a good job communicating that it's always open. It's here. If you have